Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's GAIN event. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name's Becky and I work at GAIN and obviously I'm, I'm joined by these lovely panellists here who are our industry experts that are going to be talking to you this evening. Um, just while we wait for some more people to, to arrive, I just want to give you a quick background on GAIN. So a lot of you will be familiar with us having signed up to the newsletter. If not, please do so. It's a great resource. It's every fortnight full of jobs and opportunities, the programmes we run and all events like this. So we'd love it if you signed up to the newsletter or follow us on social media. And one of the things I really want to flag to you guys, obviously it, it's probably of interest, which is why you're here tonight, is that um, GAIN are actually, we're, we're taking applications at the moment for our 2023 um, internship program. So that if you're looking for a role in 2023 during your summer break, if you're in uh, the penultimate year at university and studying in the UK, we would love to hear from you. Applications are open until the 23rd of October. So head to gainuk.org and there's loads of details on there. You'll, you'll find loads of information loads of people that have done it before, case studies, what it's all about um, and we'd love for you, for you guys to apply it. So it's a really great opportunity. So I think that is kind of enough uh, from me. You've not come to hear from me. I'm going to hand over to Tori this evening who's going to moderate the session and uh, kick off. So Tori, over to you. Thank you very much. Becky, and hello and thank you to all of our participants this evening. It's really great to be back at another GAIN event. We have um, a really super lineup of panelists for you this evening. So I thought that what might be helpful to do in terms of kicking off is to ask each panelist to introduce themselves and just tell you a little bit more about their career to date. And then we can move on to the main topic of the evening, which is obviously walking you through a typical assessment process and helping you really understand what hiring managers are looking for in investment management firms. Um, Tani, do you want to kick off just to introduce yourself to, to begin? And then we'll move on to the, the other panelists for a quick introduction. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Tori. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tani Mount. I am responsible for business development at Capstone Investment Advisors, um, which is a global multi-strategy hedge fund. Um, and I can go into a little bit more detail on that later in the call. Um, background, my career background um, and, and journey to where I've gotten to today um, is actually through executive search. So I spent approximately seven years um, spanning across two different firms, one a very small boutique firm um, and the other a much more global publicly listed firm um, for a couple of years where I was working on private capital clients, um, mainly within the private equity space. And um, just under two years ago, made the jump into effectively a client seat, if you will. So I moved uh, in-house, some people call that move, and um, have joined Capstone. Uh, where I'm responsible for business development across Europe and Asia for the fund. Thank you, Tani. Thank you very much. Amina, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm, I'm so happy to, to see that there are so many of you guys uh, that have joined today. It's really exciting to see uh, so many people in, interested in um, the industry. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background around me. So um, I work in equity research at Fidelity at the moment. Um, I, what that basically means is I research different companies um, and decide if we should invest in them or not. And I specialize in technology companies. Um, I actually only joined Fidelity earlier this year. Um, and prior to that, I was at JP Morgan Asset Management for 10 years. Um, and when I was there, I was also um, an equity research analyst and towards the end of my time had just started picking up some portfolio management roles. Um, and when I was there, I was covering um, transport, leisure and business service companies across Europe. Um, and my sort of entry into sort of this world World was I basically did um, an internship with JP Morgan. Um, but when I interned with JP Morgan, I actually interned in um, MA. Um, and then for a few reasons, decided that MA was not where I wanted to be. So I'm happy to take any questions on that as well, if anyone had any. Um, but then ultimately decided that I would rather be in the asset management side. Um, 
And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's been my journey. <laughs> Thank you, Omana and uh, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Great to see so many students joining. My name is Lisa Bainkina. I graduated just last year and then went straight into an off cycle with leveraged finance, which then led me to uh, join private credit for an internship, uh, which I converted. And it's been about five months uh, that I've been uh, within the team at CVC. Very happy to take any questions on the differences between leverage finance and private credit. And do please do ask any questions that you have in the chat. Thank you very much. And um, my name is Tori Hindman. My background is in executive search. So I, ha I have not worked as an investor in an investment management firm but I've spent um, 20 years working with investment management firm clients. So my area of special specialization is asset management, helping them to recruit individuals to join their business, um, largely at a senior level and actually not just investments, but also distribution and general management. But clearly, um, the, the, the themes are very similar in terms of what I see from clients, in terms of what they are looking for and the kind of assessment process that they put people through when they are hiring them or looking to hire them onto their investment teams, whether that's at graduate level or actually at a more senior um, experience level, a lot of the themes remain the same. Um, I'm also personally very passionate about um, broadening the pipeline of talent coming into investment management. So have always been thrilled to be involved with Girls Are Investors so that we can, we can get in touch with all of you at this crucial stage when you are in university and thinking about what career you might want to pursue. And I can, I can wholeheartedly say that Asset management and investment management is really a wonderful industry to think about pursuing a career in. So thank you um, very much, everybody, for introducing yourselves. And what we thought might be helpful um, for you all participating this evening is to, to really start by walking you through what a typical assessment process looks like, what hiring managers are looking for, what kind of knowledge, what kind of skills, how much enthusiasm, all of those things that you might be wondering about or researching. So um, we thought that um, Tani might kick off by sharing with you all a sense of that journey and the kind of uh, sort of assessment process that a firm like Capstone has been, been looking at. And we will obviously then um, also open up to input from Lisa and Amina, and um, I'm sure we will have many questions as well from all of you. Tani, do you want to, to, to jump in? Absolutely. So as I mentioned, you know, I sit within the business development team at, at Capstone, which is a global multi-strategy hedge fund. Um, I'm, I'm based in London, but the firm is actually headquartered in, Hong, uh, pardon me, in New York. And we have offices in Hong Kong and a number of other offices uh, across North America and, and Europe. Um, and so in terms of, you know, where... And, and this is helpful just to give some context in terms of our investment process and how we look at that, um, the, the, the assessment of that talent coming into the business. So I'm responsible for everything on the investment side in terms of talent, primarily portfolio management selection. So those senior individuals who are you know, running a book of risk capital coming into the fund um, across Europe and Asia and liaising very closely with my colleagues in the, in North America, but also the, the the full gamut, if you will, of investment talent coming into the business. So right from our, you know, investment internship program, which we run every summer, um, and 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 we have individuals coming in, spending a ten or or twelve week period with us, with a couple of our different investment um, senior uh, leaders within the London and New York offices, um, right through to our investment graduate program, which is a two year sort of rotational program, effectively, um, through to associate portfolio managers, which are a slightly more junior 
member of the investment team, still potentially running risk capital, um, but but still, you know, some way to develop into before, you know, before they effectively are their own standalone portfolio manager. And so that should give you a sense. I mean, there's a number of different routes to enter Capstone, but I've been heavily involved in each sort of aspect of, of those types of roles that I've just described. And so, so there's a slight variance depending on the role, depending on the level of experience, but, but for the purposes of this call and, and all of the participants on it, I thought slightly more useful to cater towards our um, the, 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 the assessment process for our internship and graduate rotation program. And so, as you might be aware, and this actually isn't, um, th this is, I, you know, I believe to be um, the case across the entire industry, but it is an incredibly competitive one. So when positions are open, applications are, are, are opened and, you know, very frequently we would receive, you know, in the thousands of, of CVs. So just to start on that point, and it's probably one that you're more than familiar with, um, but I think, you know, look, apply, we, we receive thousands of applications. And I think the application itself has to say something. There are particular, um, perhaps, you know, buzzwords, maybe, maybe as a little bit of jargony, but there are particular words given the space that we're in as an investment manager that really stand out in a in a resume and we unlike maybe some other firms we, we don't use um a computer sort of um scanner to to scan resumes it's it's done currently in capstone um by people on the team so it is people scanning and reading these but given given the volume I mean particular words on there are important so whether or not you've had experience in the industry before but you may have an interest in investment management that's really important to outline um, because we appreciate that that individuals who are still at university may not have spent time in the industry yet right this is a first step in there but I think you know and I really emphasize that it's important to really draw out you know your interest level in in the industry and any whether it's courses or uh, research that you've done whether it's you know in your course at, at within your studies or it's something you know of, of your own um, accord in your own time I think it's really important to have on there and um, so once the once resumes and, and CVs etc are all reviewed, um, there are certain things in particular that that we're looking out for, and some of those vary uh, in terms of technical skills. Right, I mean we we're, we're typically looking for we're quite a quantitative fund, not not purely quantitative, but I would say that those individuals that are studying something or at least are, are displaying a propensity to get into the, the industry, that's really important. That is usually flagged very early on upon scanning. Um, so those individuals usually go through into a kind of first tranche. Um, we do look for other technical skills such as programming, whether it's you know Python, C++, Java, et cetera. And a lot of university courses cover those. And there's a lot of university courses that can be done through you know, summer terms, et cetera, or in evenings. That are offered. Um, so I, I, I would always emphasize that kind of early stage at application. There are a couple of key points that are that are important to, to, to um, be aware of. As we move through the, the process, we start with a screening call. Um, one of the members of, of the team that I sit on will do a quick sort of 15 to, to 20 minute screening call going through. And this is really to draw out the, the personality, your enthusiasm to get into the industry, as well as touching on some of the technical pieces and, and experience that you've had so far in, in your resume. Um, usually they move forward into a call with myself or if this is someone that's sitting in, in North America, it would be my counterpart, my colleague in North America. And that would be a slightly more in-depth discussion around the actual motivation, getting into the industry, your skill set, maybe some of the experience that you've had to date. Um, and as we proceed, we would typically ask for, and now this is something that I, I really, I want to caveat because it's something that we look at on a scale as opposed to something that's a hard and fast yes or no but we do um 
and this, this is for both of our internship and our graduate rotation program, we do ask applicants who have reached that, that um, stage in the process to take part in a, um, a basic coding test. And this is something that, again, I really want to emphasize this because it, it's not a hard and fast. If you score poorly, it, it, it means that you can never have an opportunity here. It's, it's absolutely not that. We look at it slightly more on a scale. Our investment internships and the investment graduate rotation program are sitting with specific investment pods here. We refer to them as pods. They're effectively investment teams running risk capital, and they're focused on investment strategies, whether those are in equities, whether they're in across the fixed income universe, um, whether they're in, in, in you know, foreign exchange, for example. And it's important, so, some of those teams are slightly more quantitative and require um, individuals on the team to have a, have a higher propensity and, and a higher proficiency in, in coding and, and using particular coding languages. And so being able to, 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 scat, to, to gauge what um, level someone is at that, at that point um, in the process is very helpful for us to determine where and which teams they might actually fit best with. So we ask for that. Um, it's also quite frequent that you would be asked to do a verbal reasoning test. And again, that's pulling out some of those, you know, I want to say softer skills and, and, and um, you know, uh, being able to, to share, I guess, a fuller picture of what you are as, a, as an applicant on top of the, the CV in the first two calls. After that, the process is very quick. Um, it is two further steps. So you would spend time, you would spend usually about 30 to 45 minutes with one of our associate uh, portfolio managers or traders, depending on the team. And um, based on the verdict of that conversation, it's a final round with the portfolio manager that you would be ultimately assigned to be working with, whether it's through that 10, 12 week internship program or um, the, the first rotation, which is six months on the graduate rotation program. So it's, you know, three, three official conversations. Um, one coding test at times we would ask for a verbal reasoning um and of course the, the screening call at the beginning so it can be and, and this is something that can all be you know done in a, in a fairly in fairly quick succession so we like to do that in you know a fairly short amount of time but that's at a high level our timeline and and process when when looking at individuals coming into the the investment team at this level Super. Thank you very much, Tani. That's a, been an excellent overview um, and snapshot of how uh, a typical assessment process works. And I at, at Capstone, and I'm sure there'll be some similarities and some differences, um, Lisa and Amina, uh, in terms of your experiences and the firms that that you've worked at. Um, Amina, is there anything that, that you would add or perhaps compare and contrast based on your experience currently at Fidelity or indeed um, where you worked previously, which I think you said was JP Morgan Asset Management? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, for us, I think one of the first things that I would say is that um, actually the background that you have uh, doesn't matter too much. So like, I think that sometimes with the roles um, that kind of are presented in the investment management world, and, and there might be some buckets where, you know, quant scales are more important, but there are a lot of roles where actually it's not really about your quant skills. So for example, for the research analysts that we have, we have people who have done things like classics. We have people who have done, you know, like chemistry, we have we have like a whole host of different people. Um, and actually, what we're trying to look for more is just somebody who has the ability to think in like a strategic or logical way. Um, and so whilst we kind of have some some similarities in terms of, you know, we'll have like some some online questions and like a personality test. Um, after that, there's like an assessment center. And at the assessment center, um, what we do is we have, um, we'll have a couple of interviews, which are sort of more just general, you know, getting to know you type of interviews. Um, but then what we have is like, there's like um, three hours where you're kind of given some like 
bits of information about a company. Um, it'll be, you know, things like their annual report or news releases about them, um, some financials, um, and you get given some time to sort of look at those. And then there's an hour um, for you to discuss that with um, one of the one of the interviewers um, and uh, discuss whether you think that this would be a good company to invest in or not and why. And one of the things that I would stress about that is it's not really about knowing the financial jargon because I think that I remember when I was applying that was the thing that I was really scared about I was like you know I don't really know what EBITDA is I don't know what these words are are they going to expect me to know all of these things and I'm just going to look really stupid um, and actually like what we're trying to think about and look for more is how do they think about the future so you know when when a company is picked there's there's a lot of thought that goes behind okay which company should we should we suggest and it'll be a company that you know is more familiar to you so it might be something like mcdonald's or it might be something like netflix so something that you're kind of familiar with um and we just want to know you know how do you think about what the future for this business could look like um and that's the thing that we're trying to look for the most is just do you have the ability to think about sort of potential risks um potential opportunities um and so that's that's the main crux that i would say is is important to us when we're assessing candidates and i would say it was a similar thing at jp morgan asset management as well over here, whilst they have um, a dedicated session um, at the assessment center for that, at JP Morgan Asset Management, they never used to have like a dedicated session for that. But within the interviews, you would talk about, okay, like tell me about a company that you like and why. So it was similar sorts of things. Super. Thank you, Amina. That's very, um, very helpful. And actually, I think really interesting for all of our participants to hear a bit about you know, the, the, the differences, right, in terms of what a, a multi-strategy hedge fund like Capstone might be looking for, obviously quite quant-driven, as Tani mentioned, in certain strategies in certain areas, versus what perhaps a, a, a broader firm like JP Morgan Asset Management might look like, where they're running a whole range of um, investment products across public markets and private markets and probably hedge funds and long only. So I think it's really interesting to have both of those um, compare and contrasts. Um, Lisa, it'd be great to hear your experience. And actually, I think for, um, for all of our participants, really interesting for them to relate to you, given that you're um, pretty fresh into your role, but you've been an intern and you've been through many of these processes. So anything that you would like to add or compare and contrast based on your experience to date? Yes, so on top of uh, what the girls mentioned, I wanted to give some recommendations and summarize my uh, interview experience because I interviewed ever since uh, I was in uh, second year of university and it was a lengthy process and it was difficult because it was COVID. Uh, what I would recommend in summary uh, as you're interviewing for the vice ed, and it's very exciting because it's different from interviewing for m and roles in uh, particular, uh, or equity research roles, uh, for instance. So I would say uh, you need to decide what area interests you so you can read up as much as possible and be very particular in uh, the information that you search for, and the people that you speak to. But at the very start, you need to chat to various professionals in the industry to figure out what you what interests you most, whether it's private credit or private equity. And within private equity, do you want to focus on healthcare? Do you want to um, have regional coverage, for instance? So I would start with that. A lot of people mention that you have to read up the FT and Wall Street Journal and it all is very vague, but yes, that's how you accumulate the knowledge. That's how you understand what's happening in the industry. And that's how you build up the passion that will be conveyed uh, throughout the assessment process. And the assessment process will involve a case study, whether it's a business. So it's good to have um, an equity pitch on hand, choose a company, um, look at the financial statements, uh, understand it's not going to be easy straight away, but with time as it passes 
uh, it'll become much easier. And the what will help you is uh, getting an internship or getting a spring week, uh, getting head started, doing something, at least something that will help you understand what's happening in, in the industry and talking to people that so you'll figure out what you actually enjoy and then you'll be able to apply for a full-time position that uh, you like that suits you a bit better so and i would say there is no way of skipping diving deep and studying studying a lot for those interviews you need to you record yourself uh practicing those questions and you need to get comfortable speaking so try speaking to yourself in the mirror try um, practicing those questions with friends and also practicing how you analyze businesses because that will be helpful it's not a one-off you will actually implement everything you've learned the communication skills that you've developed um, the analysis that you've developed in preparation for those interviews and the people that you met, you might stay in contact with them. They might become your mentors, they might become your good friends. So I would say do your research, uh, prepare case studies, of course, and don't be afraid. You're also, you're also assessing the other side. And as funny as it is, it is true. Uh, so go for coffees, go, um, do schedule chats with uh, the firm that you're thinking of to understand whether it's a good cultural fit because the assessment process will involve the technical interviews, the case studies, but also it will involve uh, cultural interviews as well. People would like to know whether they would uh, work, uh, whether you fit the team, whether they would work well with you. So that is part of the assessment process. And you also need to understand whether you would enjoy working uh, within that organization and cultures are very different at uh, different firms so don't don't be afraid and uh, it doesn't matter if you get rejected you will get the opportunities you will go through various internships but then you will figure out what you enjoy um, I'll pass on to Tori thank you Lisa that was very helpful and actually I think that is a really important point that I think people tend to forget when they are applying for roles and interviewing and of course the mentality is I really want to get the job but actually I often say to people any coffee you have any networking you do any interviews that you have formal interviews with a firm on zoom in person it's as much as you figuring out if it's the right firm for you yes okay you are being interviewed right you are being assessed but it's your chance to do your research and your homework and you will be amazed at how different these investment management firms can all will they will all be very very different so the more firms you can meet the better the more networking you can do the better as lisa has has said because you you will know when you're feeling a really good fit and if if you're not feeling it, don't don't despair because it's it may well not be the ideal firm for you. So I think that's really important on the the cultural fit front. Um, thank you everybody for um all of our panelists for this fantastic input. And I think that's taken us to about halfway through, which is quite nice timing because. I think we have a lot of great questions coming through from our participants, which is fantastic. Um, one of the first ones coming through is why investment management? You know, why did you pursue going into investment management? Um, Tani, do you want to start with that, given that you've you've made an interesting pivot into that world quite recently? And then um, Amina and Lisa, be lovely to hear from you as well in terms of what attracted you to it and why did you decide to join Capstone? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to the point before, you know, I think and, and this is um, this is something I think probably stands out across different firms and many different industries, in fact, but often it's the people that really attract you into a role um, or into a culture or into an environment. 
And so while I was uh, in my in my prior role, I was working within a, a global exec search firm. And, and so therefore servicing, you know, private clients effectively similar to hedge funds, not hedge funds, but but that operate in a similar manner, sort of private equity funds. And so understanding from a bit more of a distance how broadly that industry worked, um, it, it, has, it had always been appealing. It had always been something that was, you know, very interesting and quite fascinating to me. And then particularly in hedge funds, historically, it is beginning to change. But historically, that's been an industry that actually it's been somewhat difficult to to really understand the firms that operate within hedge fund, the hedge fund industry. And, you know, hedge funds typically have been this quite sort of secretive places. Now that I'm noticing is changing, um, thankfully. Um, but it, it so it's always been somewhat appealing. And I have to admit there was, you know, it really was, it was on to the people. So whenever I was, I was approached about the opportunity, I thought, you know, look, sounds interesting I will certainly have the conversation and it snowballed you know I, I I clicked with the people that I met with um and that was at people at all different levels within the organization and I was very much I think the point made previously around you, you have to be aware when you're going into an interview process that you are in many senses interviewing the firm and interviewing the culture uh, that you might be partaking in and, and, and joining. So all of those boxes were ticked um, for me and, and, and I joined and I'm glad I did. And it was, it was about the opportunity to do so. But, you know, I find actually that it's an industry and, and I can really only speak from my experience at Capstone, but I have seen this and knowing some other individuals at other firms, um, that it's, it's an industry where there are a lot of bright people who work in it. Um, it's actually incredibly low ego. People are really hardworking, but it's a low ego environment. So despite what you might see on, you know, on television about the drama series that there are around investment managers and bankers, et cetera, I actually think that it's, it's an environment where there's actually not a great deal of hierarchy and the people are engaging and it's, it's a, more often than not, it's a really open door policy. So it, you're encouraged to be curious, you're encouraged to ask questions, to develop, to improve, and ultimately it, it's fast paced. And so therefore you're picking up things really quickly. And for, you know, for a lot of people, that's really exciting. And for me, that, that was the case. Good. Um, Amina, view from you on why you pursued investment management versus other industries or careers you could have looked at? Yeah, sure. So, um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, I actually did an internship in M and A um, and decided to pivot into this. Um, and actually, if, if I'm being completely honest with you guys, um, one of the key reasons why I pivoted was I hated the hours in M and A, and I think that it's one of the things which people are sometimes scared to discuss. And I think that when you're sitting on your side of it. Sometimes you can feel like it can come across as well. I'm lazy if I ask that kind of question or if I try to find out like what the hours are like. But it is such an important question to like find out about because this is going to be your life for for a significant period of time. And so understanding like the type of work life balance that you want. I think is really important. And that also goes with when you're interviewing with different firms, like understanding what the expectations are um, and what the day-to-day -day looks like for people. And so when I was doing my M&A internship, um, what I recognized that I liked was learning about companies. Like I found that part interesting, but I was like, I don't want to be at work every day until 2 a.m. This is not the life that I want. Um, and so then I was like, okay, what can I do that allows me to learn about companies, but sort of has a better work-life balance? Um, and that's kind of how I... Um, discovered sort of the asset management side and equity research um, on the buy side. Um, and what's kind of kept me in it is that um, I think that I really enjoy um, learning and thinking about, you know, 
structural change within industries and how to think about the world changing. And within this role, one of the things which I found is that you get exposure to things very quickly and very early in your career. So within like the first year of me sort of um, starting my starting my job, I was already meeting CEOs and CFOs of companies and discussing like how they're thinking about the world. And to me, that was like super interesting. Um, and that's kind of one of the things which has meant that I've sort of stayed in the role because I really, I really like that aspect. Um, and one of the other things which um, I've really liked about this role um, is that uh, there is a lot of independence that is given to you in terms of how you manage your workload. So um, if I want to, you know, start working at 10 a.m. and finish like later, that's fine. If I want to start at 6 a.m. and finish a bit earlier, that's kind of fine. Like I've I've generally found at the two firms that I've worked at that there has been a lot of flexibility in terms of sort of the way that you want to work and you're not micromanaged too heavily. So that's been kind of one of the things which um, I've, I've also really liked. Um, and I guess one other thing that I suppose I would uh, say is, and this will be different for different roles um, that exist within each of our firms, um, is that uh, there are nuances in terms of the type of work that you have to deliver. Um, so I think that it's worth thinking about what exactly you enjoy doing from the perspective of um, so in the type of role that I work in, I kind of work quite solo and I'll be working on a project quite long term and then deliver something at the end of it. Whereas other people's jobs will be more like, there'll be more daily sorts of tasks to do. So thinking about what works better for you is probably also something that's important. Super, thank you, Amina. And I, and I love the, the story of pivoting from, um, m and a and I can relate to it because years ago at the beginning of my executive search career I thought I don't want to work for the investment banking clients because they don't always seem very pleasant and actually the reason I decided to focus on asset management from a search career perspective was I thought that the asset management clients that I had met were <laughs> really lovely people and actually really thoughtful and and pretty long term and a little bit lower ego. So I, I think it's great feedback to be honest and direct about, you know, what felt better for you and what didn't. Uh, because as Amina said, um, we all spend so much of our time working. You want to make sure it's an environment and a setup and a culture that you're really going to to, to enjoy a lot. Um, Lisa, tell us, tell us um, qu quickly why for you, why investment management and you were obviously focused on that for, for 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 a while in terms of getting to the role that you have have now i'll uh, split this into two points firstly uh, similar to the girls definitely exposure you get a um, much bigger exposure to various stakeholders uh, whilst you're very junior in your career and Later on, as you progress, uh, your relationships will become more important. You will uh, be exposed to debt advisors, sponsors, and other lenders as well uh, within the clubs. So it is very interesting, very exciting. And secondly, again, the nature of the roles. Uh, each role is different uh, within uh, the asset management industry, but mine attracted me by um, the fact that I um, executing, I am actively analyzing various businesses that come our way. I am a generalist, so I look at various sectors rather than focusing on one, which is perfect for the beginning of your career. And I also get that exposure to portfolio monitoring, um, seeing what happens with the company over time. So it was a good balance of responsibility, exposure, and uh, lack of one particular focus area at the very beginning of my career. Super, thank you. 
A um, few more questions that have come in, which is great. This, this is an interesting one, actually. Um, what kind of buzzwords do you look for on a CV? Tani, I wondered if you had a view on that or a sense of what Capstone might look for. And actually, is the flip side of that actually that perhaps it's not buzzwords that you're looking for? And actually, should people be careful about not falling into the trap of using certain buzzwords and thinking of a bit of a different tack to take when submitting a CV um, and writing a CV? I think you're on mute. Sorry about that, I was. Um, so absolutely, I would say, authenticity is key around this so you know I, I actually I don't like the term buzzwords although I use it at the beginning of the call um because it's something that you know it's you can you can get an example of a list of buzzwords that you need for the industry from the internet and and you know anyone can can kind of slot them into a, a, a resume or an email um so I would certainly avoid the most common sort of buzzwords if you will unless those that are really authentic to either your interests or the experience that you have to date and and that you know that is gearing towards what you're applying to what I would always say is and this seems like an incredibly rudimentary comment to make but be aware of of specifically the you know the the role that you're applying for and while you you'll likely not have done that before um done this role before so you don't need to be an expert in it by any means but I would always say do that research like Lisa said you know it's important to do the research around what it is the firm broadly does and then taking into consideration the 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 role spec that you'll see on the website or or whichever means that you've gotten it and try to pin that closely to your interests whether and, and whether it's sort of projects that you've done in your free time whether it's reading or research that you've done in your free time or in fact if it's you know career experience that you've garnered through an internship work experience or through your course and I think naturally those words and phrases will come up because it's completely authentic um the last thing that the companies and I would say that you know this is something that could be very quickly vetted out by um you know a quick screening call is that whenever someone is not you know they haven't they haven't thought through their thinking of you know why this might be appealing why this might be interesting to pursue and, and look at further so you know it, it I can provide a, a list of of, near, uh, of words, but I think what what is most important in this process is to be completely authentic about what you think you know you, you're most interested in when you read that spec and how that pertains to to things that you might have done thus far. Super, thank you very much, Tani. Amina, there was a question specifically for you. What growth stories would you focus on in terms of internet and tech companies? I'm assuming that's in the context of what stories might you focus on if you were being interviewed or you were asked to provide an interesting growth company example. Um, but I, I suppose it may also relate to it, you know, at the moment, what might you you focus on, but if it, in terms of your day to day work, but thinking about that question, um, if, if you were interviewing or you were interviewing somebody, uh, is there any particular standout um, growth story or stop from the Internet or tech space, which has obviously been having an interesting time lately? Yeah, so I guess uh, what I would say to that is um, actually I would I would probably think about it more broadly in terms of what are the what are the bigger trends that are going on. Um, so for a lot of the tech companies um, within software, one thing which is driving a lot is um, a migration towards cloud. Um, and that's something that is, you know, impacting a lot of different companies across the tech space. So if you're being interviewed, that's something that 
that's kind of like an interesting thing to talk about um, and you know why why you think that's happening um, why you think that that might change things why you think that that is important or not important um, so something like that which is quite broad based and driving change for a lot of the technology companies that's probably something that's quite interesting to, to sort of think about um, and it also means that you can sort of um, be a little bit more individualized in terms of like even if you do take an interest in one particular company it can be something that you're particularly drawn to and i think that that sometimes makes a bigger difference like if if i were to tell you you know okay you should you should talk about amazon because you know it's something that like everybody cares about as an interviewer, I don't really care that you're talking about Amazon versus if you're talking about some really niche thing that you're particularly interested in. I care more about, oh, look at look at how much interest they have in this thing. So whilst there are broad themes that are important, like say cloud, like say the fact that um, all companies across all industries right now are really increasing their um, digital spend um, and COVID was one of the things that accelerated that. Um, and obviously now as we've sort of like um, come out of COVID, that spend has, has kind of like decreased to some degree, but it's still more elevated than it was prior to COVID. And so knowing about things like that, and then applying it to a particular company that is of interest to you, I think that is one of the things which will probably stand out more than if I tell you any one particular company. Yeah, super. Thank you very much, Amina. Lisa, there was a question for you. Are there any particular resources such as websites that were especially helpful when preparing for your assessments? I think in third year of university, so a couple of years ago, I, use, uh, I used uh, packs that gave the definitions and very good explanations of uh, the main terms within the financial industry. I believe it was Wall Street Oasis once, but what I'd recommend in terms of your modeling skills, just Google, um, no, actually find on YouTube some videos that show you how to model, do an LBO. And also if you Google it on Google, I think you'll find uh, a good range of websites and see um, if uh, the explanation is clear to you, but it's been a while since uh, I've used one. So I'd recommend to actually uh, search for some on YouTube and also uh, talk to your career departments. They might have some very good packs that uh, the students who interviewed recently might have passed on and talked to um, to talk to the students from upper years or the ones who just graduated that might send across some useful materials, especially if they are in the industry or in the role that you want. So don't be afraid to reach out is uh, my biggest advice to you guys. Super. Thank you, Lisa. There was a, another question that came through from somebody um, who said that they were finishing a PhD not in finance, but actually they've developed a very strong interest in finance and investment. Someone has suggested that um, really they should first secure a graduate role that might lead to an accounting qualification and then move to a position in investment. Um, this might lead to more job security, which is important to this person. What do you think? Um, I, I have a couple of, of thoughts on that, a, a broad one, which is actually some of the most interesting and smart and capable fund managers I've interviewed over the years didn't do a degree in finance or economics. Some of the standouts studied music, actually. It's unusual, right? It's not all the time. But there's some brilliant investors out there who have used a completely different part of their brain. For example, a music degree, some have done religious studies, some might have done PPE. Um, so actually, I wouldn't feel particularly constrained by having done a non-finance degree. I think the right firm will probably welcome your ability to think broadly and laterally and to have different training. 
You may well think about doing something like the CFA qualification in due course. Um, but again, this goes back to our point about finding the right firm and the right cultural fit and linked to that will probably be the kind of firm that really values people who've been trained beyond finance and economics. But but Tani or, or um, Amina or Lisa, I wondered if any of you had a, a view on that or had come across that kind of question or, or had colleagues with a different background that wasn't necessarily finance um, or, or economics or something related to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in there. I would completely agree with you. I don't think, um, and we have, you know, and I can think of a number of examples of this, um, where you, you do not have to have come from a, a purely financial um, academic background to, to um, enter this industry, to be really successful in this industry and to have a long-standing career um, in the industry. So, you know, I can look at, there are, portfolio managers and, and so those individuals on the hedge fund side that manage vast amounts of, of risk capital. And, and again, I'm, I'm using specific examples here. This is a broad brush um, comment, but absolutely individuals who have not um, come through a sort of financial or engineering um, or quantitative route, but have come into seats that that are, are highly success, successful and they're very well regarded. And there's no reason why individuals that whether they have a PhD and in some something entirely different outside of finance or they have a law degree and um, all of these things, you know, I'm, I'm plucking different examples, but all of these things display strategic thinking and, and ultimately bandwidth and, and that ability to think laterally um, is much more important to many firms long term than those sort of shorter term technical skills that you can learn. And as you need to, you will learn. And Super. I guess one thing, one thing that I would add, I, I would actually say the opposite to what um, the person has advised you simply from the perspective of, I actually think that if, if you're ultimate goal is to be working in investments, I think in some ways it's more difficult to start off at say an accountancy firm and then after three or four years pivot into investment management because then you're now an experienced hire. And if you're an experienced hire, there might be an expectation that, well, they should know how to think about investing and they only have an accounting background. And whilst that's not impossible to do, I personally think it makes it a little bit harder. Whereas I think if you're getting in as a graduate, um, as, as Tori mentioned, like I did CFA, for example, when I first started, um, and that kind of gives you the groundwork. And I, I actually think that if you're thinking about like, you know, your long-term career, um, having done CFA is probably just as valuable as having done um, any sort of accounting credentials. Um, and so from that perspective, you still have pretty good options. And um, I've, I mean, from the time that I've kind of worked at both firms, like there isn't like a super a super intense culture of, okay, like people get fired all of the time. Like it's been pretty steady, you know, like um, generally speaking, as long as you're delivering a reasonably good job, like they, people don't try to fire you. Like even if somebody's struggling, um, it'll be a case of, uh, okay, how can we help this person to do better? Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily more of an investment management culture thing, but that is something that I've definitely found. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be overly stressed about, you know, that there's more career risk if you, if you go into this field first. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Amina. Um, there was another question that I think others may find um, at the moment. I, I got an offer for a graduate trainee role with an investment management firm. However, it's just been rescinded because of economic pressure. Any advice for what a recent grad can do now? My personal view would be don't, you know, don't give up. Um, having seen a few difficult market cycles as we are seeing at the moment, 
Um, this is this is normal behavior for a lot of firms. They will rescind offers and they won't want to be adding any more cost and they will be trimming costs. But that won't go on forever. And in my experience, firms tend to all pull back on hiring at the same time. And then they all start hiring again at the same time. The trick is to be patient in between. The trick is also to be persistent. So don't give up. There will be other firms out there that are not rescinding offers and that still are hiring and are able to. I would absolutely keep in touch with the firm that has rescinded the offer. So keep in touch, follow up, make a note to check in with your contact there in a couple of months time, see how they're going. Appreciate that you're probably under a time frame and you want to land a role, but you would be amazed at how many people don't follow up, don't keep in touch, assume that the ties are completely cut and that firm will start hiring again. The question of course is when. So do keep in touch and do be persistent with looking at other firms that may be, um, may be hiring. And, and if investment management is really what you want to focus on, I would say don't give up on that. Don't give up on that either. Um, Amina or Lisa or um, Tani, I don't know if you have anything else to add in, in terms of that generally or other sort of industries where you might pivot to. But if your heart's set on investment management, I would say don't. I would say keep keep going and don't give up. And I think at the time, it's, you know, when those things happen, it can be so devastating. But when you when you kind of get like a few years in and you, you look back at the time, as long as you've used that time in a way that kind of has has helped your life in some way, actually, it, it won't. It feels really bad now, but it'll be OK in like five or 10 years time. I know that's really easy to say when we're sitting on this side of the fence, but truly, like even even if you choose to travel or something, you know, actually things like that can enrich your life in a way or give you perspective on something. And, you know, like that will be the thing that you end up talking to somebody about in an interview. And that will be the thing that like connects you. So, you know, those types of things, actually, even though they can feel like this is this is so devastating to me right now, can sometimes actually work out in the long term. True. Continue applying and don't regret that this opportunity is gone because you'll find something even better, even more suitable for you. And there are plenty of opportunities in the market. Even if it's not investment management, you will always, you can always end up here and continue studying, doing various courses, reading and it will uh, make the interviewing much easier and you'll definitely find something very, very soon. I think we have time for one last quick question. Um, Lisa, you may have a view on this. Um, you talk about research and individual projects done, but where might you fit this in on a CV? saying I read The Economist or I've Googled this company doesn't have any proof or accreditation. So how might you incorporate that into a resume? I guess sort of managing how you collate and then communicate maybe investment management clubs you've been involved in or any other interests um, that you've had in and around the industry. It is difficult to put your reading from FT on your resume. So your reading will help you understand the industry better and then apply for various courses, which you can mention. But also don't restrict yourself to only joining the women in business, or uh, women in finance societies at university. Uh, also do sports, uh, join various projects for that. Speak to seniors, uh, at university and uh, research what kind of opportunities are out there on your uh, university page, for instance. And that way you'll find something that enriches your CV from uh, an academic perspective, but also you might find a project uh, that you can uh, put on your CV in, for instance, your interests, or you can even put it in uh, your work experience uh, section if it's, uh, for instance, a startup uh, that you helped with uh, 
where you helped with marketing, for instance, or where you helped with uh, business development, it will come very handy because every role has that, um, has a bit of marketing in it, relationship building, and you will see as the more internships you have or the more experience you have, you'll see how to implement it and how to put the uh, buzzwords in, uh, as you say, and it'll uh, become much easier. Absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you very much to all of our participants this evening. You've asked some fantastic questions. And thank you very much to Amina and Tani and Lisa for participating as panelists and hope, hope to keep in touch and best of luck to all of you as you continue to focus on and pursue careers in, um, in the investment management space.